Uh, last week, in this very spot, the president of this almost august institution said, uh, we have to work to ensure the relevance of our training programs, of our master's programs, the professional relevance, were his exact words, and he's right. That's the bottom line. At an institution like this, you have to train people for professional work at the highest level, and if you're not doing that, you're not operating. And he went on to say, uh, we don't do research. And then he corrected himself. I said, well, we don't do doctoral research. We don't get doctoral degrees, uh, which is also true. Uh, and it seemed that there was an opposition then uh, between training people for high-level work in professions and, and doing research. Um, I don't think anybody could disagree that you have to ensure the relevance of your training, the professional relevance. I don't think anybody could disagree that this is one thing that this institution does very well and has been doing very well for some time and should continue in, in that line. However, I'm interested in the extent to which our training in itself can keep up with what's going on in professions. Basically, the model we have here, by tradition, is a, something you find in the Renaissance and Middle Ages even. It's a master-apprentice model. Your teachers come in and teach you how to do what they do very well, and they are practitioners when we're talking about uh, translation and interpreting. And that has been a very, very good model, because as changes occur in the profession, Outside of the classroom, your teachers, your trainers are well aware of that, and that gets ferried very quickly into your training process. Now, that master apprentice model is good and has worked very well. However, it may stumble in some kinds of situations. And one situation is a time of rapid technological change. Why? Well, it's just a generation thing. Uh, people who are trained to work in, some way, in a certain way with certain technologies resist, naturally, change to new technologies. It's a phenomenon that's well studied by the sociology of technology. New technologies are resisted by the people who attain power with the old technologies until they find a way to make them work for their own benefit and then they adapt them with zeal. And that has been happening among, uh, among our colleagues here at this institution in the four years that I've been here. I think four years ago I, I was hearing people say, well, nobody really uses translation memories. You know, this, this is it's not. And if you can't translate with a pen and paper, you can't translate, which is true as well. So let's sort of sideline all these other activities, all these new technologies that are coming on. Uh, okay. But the younger uh, people who haven't been so uh, embedded into market niches where the old technologies are operative, the younger people who are going into what's called localization, localization companies, the younger teachers here I'm talking about, your trainers, your professors, uh, they will latch on very quickly to what's happening. And you get this period of tension within the institution about not just the technologies, but about the skills we should be training you in. And that's where the first challenge to the master-apprentice model comes in. The generation gap, the resistance, that is a phenomenon of all technological change. The second problem is even more important in this context. The changes that are occurring in our economies uh, basically involve a move to a knowledge-based economy. I'm speaking of your countries as well as this country and the country that I work in. And one of the basic tenets of a knowledge-based economy is that new knowledge is produced, innovation occurs within the society, and is transferred rapidly to the means of production. The great model, I mean, Europe has been so far behind the United States that, that it's laughable. But um, uh, 10 years ago, Europe decided that it was going to become the world's decided. 
put, it would become the world's leading knowledge-based economy, the Declaration of Lisbon. And, and the key element in that model was to reform the nature of universities. They realized that the universities were not innovating enough, and they realized there was a huge barrier between universities and industry. And so a lot of investment has gone into breaking down that barrier. And, and these days at my home university, when I set up a, a research project or apply for funding, uh, I am almost obliged to, to cooperate with private enterprises. At the moment this year we have one uh, European uh, project which we just won and we're working with uh, a, a Barcelona-based localization company and Lionbridge which is the world's biggest translation localization company. Uh, the, the university institution is pushing us to do that. The model for that the thing that the whole of Europe wants to imitate, and a good rest, part of the rest of the world as well, the model is, is just up the road here somewhere. Stanford University and Silicon Valley is the foremost model in the world of what a university should be doing with respect to industry. And by the way, how a university can get rich by being engaged with industry. And, uh, and, and creating an environment where new ideas are tested very quickly and uh, knowledge is in touch, constant interaction with uh, means of production. Now that is what's happening. That's two years ago when there was a crisis in the American economy. Uh, the one thing that economists would say, you know, is this the end of the American economy or American hegemony in the world? The one thing they would say is, no, no, the economy is sound. Um, it has a, an excellent university structure. I was looking at this and said, what? But it's true. You know, it's a society that invests a lot in its tertiary education system and puts it in touch with means of production. The master-apprentice model doesn't do that. And at some level, I personally need that space of a university in which to ask the kinds of bigger, wider questions about what's happening, what innovation is, uh, what technology is doing, and uh, which way this is going. We have to, I personally need that space that is not just a space of training for a profession. You sit back, you get several degrees of abstraction, and you say, hey, what is going on here? How can we help it get to where it should go and avoid where it shouldn't go? And those kinds of questions are the space of research. And I'm going to present a few of those very, very simple notions that operate on that level. Um, I'm concerned with very basic questions like what is technology, what does it do to language in general, and what will it do to cross-cultural communication. Here's a, an, an idea of the kind of frame within which I want to think here. Um, Societies without communication technology, there's always communication technology, the alphabet is the basic communication technology, but recitative societies, societies that operate on spoken communication without great need or, 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 or desire for writing. Those societies, such as we have known them, don't have anything we would call translation or interpreting. They don't. Uh, the Indian scholar Harish Trivedi says, look, before the European uh, mass colonizations of the 18th century, in the subcontinent there was nothing we would call translation. And the, 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 the Sanskrit word for that we use for translation now, anuvad, anuvad simply means to say again, to retell, to tell the story again. And the great epics of that tradition are simply schemata that are retold and reinvented in each enactment, as was the case in, in, in European culture as well, and is probably the case in parts of your cultures. A, a spoken culture doesn't have anything we would call translation. This suggests a peculiar relationship between what we're doing and the technologies that are around us. 
You can move to uh, the basic forms of the alphabet or character uh, uh, writing in, in Asia, which becomes a technology for communicating over distance, for sending text over distance. And when you have writing, you do start to get something called translation. The Rosetta Stone, which you might have seen images of, is a translation of a written text, uh, and we would call it a translation because it's about the same length, but it was for a priestly caste, for a cultural elite, and was done with very, very few readers in mind. Uh, there are societies with primitive writing methods for whom translation does exist, but only for those cultural elites. Paper, invented by the Chinese, enters Europe via the Italian peninsula and uh, through Arabic culture in the north of Africa. It enters Europe uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries. What's interesting is it entered Baghdad in the 9th and 10th centuries and coincided in Baghdad with what was called the House of Wisdom or the Great Age of Translations, the School of Baghdad, when Greek and Syriac knowledge was put into Arabic. Uh, in the 12th, 13th century, you get what's called the School of Toledo in Hispanic, uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, when that same knowledge is put into Latin and later into Romance languages. It's been of some interest to me that these two great schools of our tradition, in the West at least, Baghdad and Toledo, coincide exactly with the use of paper. The paper. Instead of parchment. You know, people before that were writing on the hides of animals. It was very expensive. A book was heavy, uh, difficult to produce, difficult to move around. As soon as paper comes in, uh, you can do something else that people have not thought about much. Uh, you can revise it. You can do a rough copy. And uh, what happened was that prior to paper, people would discuss the translation. They would write on wax tablets, which you could then rub out with your thumb, but then get dirty. Anyway, there was a way of writing quickly and, and, and doing a rough version. But then the copyist would put it down once and for all. And once it was down on the parchment, the parchment was so expensive, ooh, you don't change that. Okay? What did paper do? It allowed revisions. And uh, we get, certainly in the School of Toledo, you get translations for which there are many paper-based copies, and then the definitive version for the king uh, in the 13th century and for the, uh, the Archbishop of Toledo in the 12th century, the definitive one is a parchment. You know, heavy, don't move around, this goes in the king's library. What happened was that the rough copies of the translations achieved circulation among the, the nobility. And you started to get translation as a wider social activity, not just for these narrow elites. And you started to get translation as something that was meeting up with the ongoing practice of copying. Uh, each version would be a little different. And if you copied out of translation, as the monasteries did, you would update it and correct it and adapt it. Medieval translation doesn't have anything that we would call equivalence. You have lots of translations, but they're all different and all meaningfully different. The age of what we call translation really coincides with print culture. As soon as you have print culture, the printing press, you have a definitive text, which is fixed, boom, produced the same in many copies, and because the text is fixed, people notice that spelling is not fixed and there are reforms of the spelling of many European languages in this case. Then there are reforms to create national languages with national spelling conventions. And it becomes possible not only to be equivalent to something, because something is fixed there, it wasn't fixed prior to that, it becomes possible to do it in a way which is equally as fixed and authorized by national conventions. The great age of translation in Europe certainly was from the Renaissance through when we have the basic idea of equivalence appearing only in the 15th century. Prior to that, I've been unable to find any theoretical concept that I would call equivalence. 
Now that's interesting for me, that overview of the whole world of communications technologies, because if anything is happening now, it's a movement to electronic communication, from print to electronic communication. And what is changing fundamentally in that movement? That's my fundamental question. Surely the fixedness. If you are working on a website, or a computer program, or virtually any document. Wait around for a week or a month and it will have changed. Everything we do can be updated. A lot of electronic communication is in fact moving us back, I suggest, to something that was there in the age, well, more of paper of paper-based communication prior to print, the age of constant updating and revisions. And I'm wondering if that is not what's going to change the nature of translation. I don't like a history of return. You know, this Nietzsche's eternal return. And we'll go back to where we were. I don't think that's happening, but I think it's an interesting question to ask. Uh, could it be that our technologies are moving away from print and moving us towards a field where new kinds of skills will be required. That's my question. Here are some attempts to answer it. And now it becomes visual. Here is a text. I'm not interested, uh, I might add, uh, technology and language can be seen in two ways. Um, technology enables me to talk here and that video will go God knows where. Uh, the Speech Act is no longer local, the Speech Act is elongated and, and prolonged uh, through time and space, and we know that. Uh, I'm more interested in what effect the technology has on the actual language in the text, or in the way texts are functioning within Speech Acts. Okay, so I'm not doing sociology here, I really am doing some kind of linguistics or pragmatics, to be more precise. You get a text, you agree that's a text. It's in English, so it has implicit instructions. The implicit instructions are, start here. I hope this works. Yes, start here. Go this way, end somewhere here. And that simple fact of our communication technology, I'm going to call linearity. Okay, you start there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, as Aristotle said in his Poetics. Simple enough. However, as soon as we start messing around with this text by any of the electronic communications we have, that linearity, that simple fact of starting there and going there, disappears. Uh, Saussure called one axis the syntagmatic axis, the axis of language that is being produced and listened to, as we're doing here. And the other axis is the axis of selection, where we get the terms and the structures we put in the text, and that is the paradigmatic. The electronic communication technologies immediately impose the paradigmatic on the syntagmatic. I'll find easier terms for the next version. This, for example, is what a concordancy tool does, where I immediately get all the co-texts for the term select. It's the same text. The concordance has simply taken away the linearity, and we can see the way that the term select is operating, if we want to study its prosonics. But that same imposition of the paradigmatic on the syntagmatic is affecting all the technologies we use all the time. Go no further. Got a problem? Google it. What happens when you get to Google? You don't read from left to right. You read from top to bottom. Because that's the way it's presented to you and it's quicker. Got a problem? Spelling mistake or looking for a, a synonym or an antonym. Right click and what do we do? Our linearity has become a vertical column to get the solution. This, I might add, for me, is the most wonderful communication technology ever invented, electronic dictionaries. I used to be a bad speller. I have been saved and enlightened by electronic dictionaries. 
The same imposition of the paradigmatic is what we find in, what's this, Trellos? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, in basic um, trans um, translation, translation memory software. Okay. What does your translation memory software do? The first thing it does, and the most important, it cuts up your text into bits, usually sentences or, or parts of sentences, and arranges them in a, a vertical manner. The paradigmatic is here, okay? Uh, and now the relationship between the text and the translation has become vertical. You're no longer reading from left to right, you're working up and down. This, I think, is the same thing. This is deja vu, it's another uh, piece of translation technology. And you can see the source text has been cut up here into segments. Uh, this is the target text, and the translator immediately goes off to solve the problem by connecting it with, you guessed it, Google. Okay, this is just a screenshot. Uh, people in my practicum class are well aware of, of how we do this and why I'm fascinated looking at poor translators trying to solve their problems. Okay, you move from the paradigmatic text to the paradigmatic. Giant. Some of you have seen this before, the same thing, but um, I, I, I keep the voice there because we study the think aloud protocols. We get Giant. translators to say what they're doing as they translate and uh, we can analyze their problem solving strategies. What's interesting though is that environment. Source, target, uh, that's an analysis of the text that's going there, and she solves the problem by opening a, a vertically arranged dictionary. Linearity is no longer to be seen. This is somebody looking at a website. The green, no, blue dot is their eyes, focused somewhere, and you will notice that as they look at the website, they don't read anything from left to right. Well, people do actually. At the top of a website, there's this T or F structure. But as soon as they figure out where they are, they head down or up to the menu. Uh, people realize quite quickly that uh, websites, despite the terminology of the web page and the bookmark, are not like books. They're more like television screens. And, uh, the, the, the kind of linguistic communication that's achieved here is once again imposing the paradigmatic. Just a few examples, but my general hypothesis is that the electronic communications we're dealing with are changing not just the way we translate, but the way the texts themselves operate. That is, People are producing texts from the paradigmatic and people are using texts in a paradigmatic way. In the website or the instruction manual or your computer software. If you're looking for a piece of information, your most valuable tool is the find function or the index to get to exactly the piece you want. And you're not going to read the before and you're not going to read the after unless any of you has ever read an entire instruction manual. No, we don't do that. Texts are operating to be used paradigmatically. They're written that way, they're used that way, and they are translated that way. The whole nature of communication is thereby changed. A translation theorist by the name of Mona Baker published a book, I think, two years, three years ago now, um, Translation and Conflict. And in this book, she argued that cultures are formed by narratives, by stories. Our identities are formed by stories we tell about ourselves and about our relations with others and that the role of translation is to incorporate and manipulate stories about the other and stories about the self. In fact, 
uh, Moda Baker reaches a point where narrative is the ontology of knowing. To know anything, we tell a story about it. And her whole study of translations in that book is based on the way translations retell and change narratives, stories. And I've been thinking about this for a long time because stories are very, very powerful and fascinating. I have a five-year-old son who still needs a bedtime story and he wants it to be a long one. Why is interesting in itself, but what is even more intriguing for me is the extreme lack of narrativity in anywhere that the electronic communication age is pushing us. The one thing we don't get in a fragment is a story. For a story, you need a sig tag. You need to start here and go there. You need the beginning, middle and end, as Aristotle said. For these technologies, you don't need the story. There are no stories are possible. Why do translators get lost in a text? Because they don't know what was before and they don't know what's afterwards. But we change that, we change the way we write the texts. And I suppose three years ago, my view of translation was remarkably negative. I would see that lack of the syntagmatic as being the lack of narrative, the lack of being able to position oneself in the world, the lack of being able to talk about people, your relation to the other, and I would have called it a completely dehumanized means of communication. The future didn't look very good. It seemed to me that with electronic tools, we were translating lists and not texts, we're translating in a non meaning way, and we forgot to speak with people. It was going to get a lot worse because, as Professor Takeda has pointed out, we have just been through what is a major revolution in machine translation. Thought to have died somewhere in the 1970s, suddenly a new lease of life in the noughties, as they say, since the year 2000. Uh, basic, why is this? Uh, it, it's quite simple. I won't go into the technology, but the use is something most of you have seen. We have got to the stage where the more you use a machine translation system, the better it gets. It learns from your translations. And that's it. That's the end of it. That's the end of all resistance. It gets better the more you use it. These are learning systems. That means if we can get people to use them, they will get good as the people who as good as or as bad as the people who use them. That's it. That's changed. It's what's in Google Translate, but in many, many other uh, uh, parts of the technological environment at, at the moment. Uh, that's changed. That's not my problem. I mean, it's obvious that's going to happen. It's obvious we have to work with that and live with it and get to be good revisers, which is incredibly important. But what about the narrativity and what about the paradigmatic? What about that communicating with people? What's happening there? I'm not alone, alone in my negative reaction. This is the order of translators, terminologists, and interpreters of Quebec. And they started two years ago a campaign to make sure that in Quebec, yes, we got our Quebecois, yes, <laughs> not every Quebecois, uh, only they would be called translators. Okay? That if people were not certified members of the order, they would not have the right to call themselves translators. And this is quite a radical imposition of the profession, or protection of the profession. Okay? Uh, because if this is not true, n'importe qui, any, just anyone can come along and call themselves a translator. How dare they do that? I'm sorry I have to do some site translating here, site interpreting. Um, 
the fact that anybody at all in Quebec can uh, call themselves a translator, terminologist, or interpreter, uh, just as long as they put, don't put the adjective um, certified uh, along with that name, uh, creates a system of uh, a double nomenclature, uh, which is going to create ambiguity uh, with respect to the general public and the risks that that involves. So, they made a request that nobody else could call themselves a translator. Which is okay because if similar things exist for lawyers and for doctors in most of our societies. Okay. What's interesting is it goes along with a discourse on the same website uh, about technology. This part is in English, so I don't have to translate. Warning, danger approaching. The automatic translation applications now available to the general public may seem useful because they give readers a general understanding of something written in the foreign language. But text generated by such software can in no way be considered as the equivalent of a true translation, which means it should be revised by a professional translator. I've put in bold here mm -hmm. a true translation and a professional translator. Mm -hmm. Notice, however, the slippage. So they have sort of accepted that the true translator is the one who can revise the machine translation output. Ooh, do we really want that to happen? As designers of automatic translation software themselves acknowledge, it goes on, it will be some time before these kinds of tools are capable of producing quality translations comparable to those produced by human beings. I'm sorry, that's dead. They no longer say that. They are now talking about reaching that stage within five years. Alan Melby is the man who's most likely saying that. Alan Melby at Brigham Young University. as part of its mandate to protect the public from this danger that's approaching. The order of translators will march up and protect you, the public. The order recommends prudence, which is fair enough, and suggests that you call on a certified translator for all your translation needs. So suddenly at the end, the role of the translator is not just to revise your scummy machine translation output, but it's to do everything. Uh, just in case. There's some ambiguity here in the mode of resistance itself about what a translator is within the society, how restrictive we can use, how restrictively we can use the term translation, and <laughs> do translators just revise, post edit, has been said, or should they do the whole lot? Now, I would broadly have agreed with that resistance. This is how fast technology changes. I would have agreed with that probably three years ago. Um, with, with, with extreme doubt, and the answer for me was to find ways of working with this technology to try to overcome its short, its deficits. But I've changed. And why I've changed is perhaps hidden within the technology itself. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a Google Translate Toolkit. This is just a program where you can combine your own translation memories uh, with the input from Google Translate, which is database machine translation. Share with others. Invite people, people with access. What? No other tool has had that. Share with others. What's this all about? Or similarly, update docu upload document, update a web page, or a Wikipedia article or null. What's this all about? And my surprise, and the surprise of others, when um, Google Translator Toolkit was released, Last year? Is it that soon? 
Last year? Two years ago. Okay. It was June, not last year, the year before. Okay. Uh, my surprise was um, that this was not presented as a professional translation tool. Professionals don't share their, their, their work, their memories with other people. Professionals don't go and translate for free, as people do with Wikipedia or at all. Uh, professionals, most importantly, would not allow their text, their information, to go onto a database that's available to everybody, which is indeed what happens with Google that. And I cite some of the reviewers of Google Translator Toolkit. This is Ignacio Garcia and um, Vivian Stevenson, 2009. It was last year. It was released last year, June last year. Okay. They, they say, with growing online facilities and potential for global collaboration, think Wikipedia, as we saw, there seems to be a multitude of people for whom day jobs are secondary to engaging with their global online fraternities from home. Strangely, for large sectors of web world, fun is becoming more work than work. Uh, it's a bit complicated there, but it's from a, a citation from Noel Coward. Uh, there are some people for whom work is fun, and fun is work. And uh, the observation here is that there are a lot of people around the place who will translate because they like to do it. It's part of participating in the creation of knowledge, or participating in societies like Amnesty International, or like Greenpeace, uh, or indeed uh, uh, Facebook, as we're going to see in just a minute. We're getting these technologies allied with non-professional translation, voluntary translation. Uh, you can't see anything in that, so I won't even try to point it out. Uh, this is from Facebook's localization, to translation of Facebook into Spanish, which I think was done in four or five days, because a lot of people participated. And they're trying to translate the phrase at the top, can't find what you're looking for. And uh, they have different proposals. No encuentras a quien buscas. No encuentras a quien estás buscando. No encuentras a la persona que está buscando etc. All these alternatives. And the users then vote. Democratic translation process. Uh, the, the, the translation with the most votes becomes the translation that goes on to Facebook. And I think this is a wonderful model for a democratic translation process. Okay? Uh, it might be a bit long, but, uh, but it was done very quickly. By the people who most know about it, because these are the people who use the website. Same thing for, uh, for Greenpeace, the people who participate in Greenpeace are the people who are going to be the best translators because they know about those issues. Or the people who, who participate in Amnesty will be the people who most, most know about the terminology political persecution. Translations done for free need not be bad translations. They can be helped enormously by these technologies and the technologies were developed for them. The question then is, firstly, what effect is that having on the problem I mentioned of narrativity and um, lack of narrative, the paradigmatic thing? And then what will translators do? Well, the big step forward for me has been the fact that translation has become in itself a social activity where people talk about it and enter a field of dialogue. People are talking about it, uh, the fan translations for Japanese manga and things. These sites are wonderful places where everybody participates. Equivalence is forgotten about entirely. It's more a place for fun and invention between languages, or across languages, perhaps. Uh, dialogue has become the model that these technologies allow us to work within. And that is what has replaced the narrativity. And I started to think, is it true, as Mona Baker says, is it true that all knowledge is produced by stories? That we learn about our place in the world through stories, 
from narrative. Think about it. Why do we send kids to school? To learn stories? Yeah, that happens. But as soon as they get there, they're engaged in dialogue with their peers and with teachers. And we now know that the educational process has to be based on dialogue between people. Not just me, I tell your story, you tell your story. What these technologies have done, and what I'm very enthusiastic about, is take something that looked like it was bereft of all human engagement at all, and they have placed it within its own very humanized, very dynamic, dialogic context. And that, for me, opens an enormous potential. Now for the problem of what we are going to do as professionals, because non-professionals are going to do a lot of the translation work. How am I going for time? It's a quick example. It's, okay, it's a true example, though, and, and <laughs> Professor Takeda will attest to the fact. Um, I was in her office last year, and she said she'd, uh, she was going to publish the Japanese translation which, uh, of, of a book that I'd done. And, um, and she said, well, can I, say, can I see the introduction? Can I see what you're going to say about me? Because I'm interested. I want it to be correct. I mean, you know, I'm involved in this bit of text. Uh, I said, well, I'll get a student to translate it. No, oh, it's going to take a week. You know, I, I, I put it through Google Translate, which I did there in the office, and then, and then three seconds later I get a really, really rough bit of English, which you can't read, but I could read enough. I could see that the places were more or less in the right order, and I could see when it was a phonetic transcription of my university of some kind, and I could see that at the end she was going to say I was a budding rock star, and I could say, Kayoko, get rid of that last bit very quickly. Okay? I'm going to get rid of that, quick, <laughs> that text very quickly as well. Uh, the point is that there are many, many communication situations across languages that are well served by rough, quick translations. That's just one example, but there are numerous others. That high quality text is not required for many dialogic situations. We're moving to a world where translation is embedded within those short-term dialogues. And only as a luxury product is going to be sent across, let's say, a three, four, or five year time span. This is a model produced by the Center for Next Generation Localization with an S located in Dublin, in Ireland. And you can't see it, but what happens? <coughs> Source text comes in, it's broken up, it's segmented, put into the translation memory for reuse, and fed by the glossary and feeds into the glossary. That then goes through machine translation, from the machine translation, it goes through what they call crowd translation, but I don't really like it. I prefer voluntary translation, collaborative translation. Citizen translation is another term, but that's yeah. voluntary translation or unprofessional, if you like. Um, and that is then passed on to a professional translator who does a revision. That is, the text can go through the machine translation be quickly revised for the people who know about the field, then be revised more for stylistic and probably uh, translational problems by a professional translator. Uh, there's a, a further uh, style-based selection, oh, and review. The thing is, reconstruction is when you put the images back with the, um, the actual text and present it in the format of, of, of a PDF or website or whatever the case may be. What's interesting in this model is that translators still have a role, a very important role, but it has moved to the level of revision. Rather than resisting what's happening out there, we're going to have to learn to work with it. Rather than accusing the others of not being translators, because a lot of them do actually very good work, uh, we should be prepared to complement the skills that they already have. 
and that they're pre prepared to use. I personally see that as a very possible future for where we want to go. Um, at some point in the lectures, I think, uh, in the overview course that I've been giving this semester, I think I pointed out the fundamental difference when you're working with a text between saying, what does this mean? And you do the linguistic work to construct it and convey that. What does this mean? And the alternative question, which is more humanized, what do you mean? What do you mean? It's the second person. And how can I say that to you? That movement from the this to the you, from the thing to the person, is a movement from text to dialogue. I think that's a good humanizing future for translation, and my sincere hope is that the technologies we have available are moving us in that direction. I thank you for your attention. Did you, did you forget to turn that camera oh, on? Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, you turn it off? Turn it off. It was on, but oh, I'm no, going to turn it off for Q&A. <laughs>